The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set, set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and then I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Amen. Well, let me start by thanking Thomas for the invitation to preach today. But I'll admit, with the events of yesterday, I come here with a heavy heart. You see, El Paso is familiar to me. I studied, I did my internship at William Beaumont Army Medical Center there in 1984 to 85 and my first daughter was born there and I've been back there during my time in the military many 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 times and we also have Dayton so today I hope you hear as I try to focus on a very fundamental truth of our faith please remember it and take it away with you today so today's Gospel from Luke and Paul's letter to the Colossians present us with a very fundamental question. What does a Christian life require of me? So many of our ancestors in the Christian faith were martyred for maintaining their principles and practices. I have to wonder, if today you and I were on trial, accused of being Christian, would we be convicted? To begin to answer this question, we need to start with just who and whose we humans are. In Genesis, we're told that humans are made in the image of God. So regardless of whether you take a literal reading of the Genesis stories of creation or see evolution as the basis by which we came to be humans, the basic tenets of Judaism and Christianity see humans as creatures uniquely stamped with the indelible mark of our Creator God. At our baptism, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Now, I'll tell you something rather personal. Every night as Dolores and I are about to go to sleep, we say a little prayer as we make the sign of the cross on each other's forehead. It's just an intimate reminder at the end of the day of our most basic identity. It's the same mark we make when we say healing prayers during communion. We always start with anointing someone with the same stamp made on each of us at our baptism, our Christian birth. The Bible, the collection of Hebrew scriptures and what we Christians call the New Testament, is a compilation of books that form a narrative describing the creation of the universe, the world, and all creatures, including us. Immediately followed, by humanity's corruption of the divine image within us and the continuing story of humanity's vacillation between following God and our disobedience. It's actually a whole lot about our disobedience. It's the story of God's never-ending work to return us to a life consistent with the divine nature 
that resides in each and every one of us. This image of God lies at the very, very core of our being. As the Collect for Guidance begins, Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. When I say this prayer every time I do morning prayer, I'm once again reminded of this essential part of my identity, of every person's identity. I don't know about you, but that's why worship is so critically important to me. I need these constant reminders. I really believe the Bible, as I've laid out, is that simple. And we hear it every Sunday. Really listen as Thomas recites the Eucharistic prayer in a few minutes. It begins with, From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, wind, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. As the events of the past day tell us, we've wandered far, far away. So the Bible tells us the whole story of God's work with humanity, culminating with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, who fully realizes God's image and presence in human form. We call this union the Incarnation. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen from the Methodist brothers and sisters here? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But the story ain't over. God's work with us and desire for us is far from complete. So given that every human bears the image of God, what does that say? How does that inform the lives of those who claim to be followers of Jesus? Paul tells us, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Within this brief selection from Colossians, we hear a litany of qualities that are inconsistent with the Christian life, behaviors that tarnish, if not corrupt, the divine image that is the foundation of who we are and whose we are. When Paul says, seek the things that are above, he is not pointing us towards some heavenly realm beyond this world. The things that are above are the values and actions we see in the life of Jesus the one who perfectly realized the restoration of the divine and human flesh. As Richard Rohr writes, Jesus came to show us how to be human much more than how to be spiritual. In my opinion, being human as God intended us to be and being spiritual are really the same thing. Following Paul's exhortations, rid yourself of anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language. Don't lie to one another, he writes. You have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. That, folks, is called baptism. Paul concludes by removing the categories that divided people then and which continue to divide us today. Only the names have changed. <coughs> Excuse me. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. And yet, our community, our churches, our nation and world are constantly defined by tribalism, the very thing Paul is confronting, the very thing we saw come to a deadly end yesterday. Our tribal labels, words and actions deny our, human, our common humanity, which is based on the image of God present in every person, no matter race, ethnicity, color, citizenship, sexual identity, orientation, political belief, or whatever. Every human being in the world is made in the image of God. 
And yet, we corrupt that image by our tribalism, which divides us into isolated clans of similar thinking and looking individuals, relegating everyone else as an other, and often treating them as something less than human. And then sometimes we kill them. Our national discourse has devolved into a series of ad hominem insults and attacks on those we disagree with, rather than any substantive discussion of actual policy options. Hear how the clergy of the National Cathedral responded just a few days ago. As leaders of faith who believe in the sacredness of every single human being, the time for silence is over. We must boldly stand witness against the bigotry, hatred, intolerance, and xenophobia that is hurled at us, especially when it comes from the highest offices of this nation. We must say that this will not be tolerated. To stay silent in the face of such rhetoric is for us to tacitly condone the violence of these words. Notice how their statement, a very strong statement, is based on our belief in the sacredness of every single human being. That's that basic truth I want you to remember. So how do we return? How do we return and abide by the words of our baptismal covenant where we affirm to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself, and to respect the dignity of every human being. Listen to the following vision described by Carol Hauslander, an English mystic. I was in an underground train, a crowded train in which all sorts of people jostled together, sitting and strap hanging, workers of every description going home at the end of the day. Quite suddenly I saw with my mind, but as vividly as a wonderful picture, Christ in them all. But I saw more than that. Not only was Christ in every one of them, living in them, dying in them, rejoicing in them, sorrowing in them, but because he was in them and because they were here, the whole world was here too. Here in this underground train, not only the world as it was at that moment, not only all the people in all the countries of the world, but all those people who had lived in the past and all those yet to come. I came out into the street and walked for a long time in the crowds. It was the same here on every side, in every passerby, everywhere. Christ. Everywhere. Christ. Would things be so different if that young man yesterday had known that vision? if every shooter had known that vision. Christ in everyone, everywhere. Don't just imagine the possibility. Know that Christ is the reality in which each and every person living, dead or yet to be, is made. Let that sink in. Christ in us is the reality in which each and every person living, dead, or yet to be is made, period. I believe a Christian life requires us to truly follow the example of Jesus the Christ in our words and actions. And it begins by allowing the image of God to really form and mold you. And by recognizing that every person on this blue globe we call Earth also is a Christ-bearing creature of God. So the next time you reflexively disagree with that person who has a very different opinion, political, religious, or otherwise, or before you share that rather pithy meme on social media, or before you pass judgment on anyone, stop. Just stop. Take a moment to see Christ in that person. Seriously, just stop. Stop and recognize that person bears the same image in God, of God that resides in you 
and me and every person on this earth. Stop and see Jesus looking back at you. Then you can respond. Oh, Fred, you're such an idealist. Yeah, well, 23 years in the Army, most of those at Fort Bragg does tend to take the idealism out of one, let me tell you that. <laughs> Maybe I am. But I prefer to think of myself as a follower of Jesus. Yep, a follower who has done more than my share of stumbling, who never lacks for things to confess, but nevertheless one who aims to follow Jesus as best I can. After all, love God and love your neighbor as yourself aren't ideals. They're commandments we have promised to follow. They're commandments. One word on the Eucharist. The guy who repaired some holes in our ceiling this past week went to a revival, something most of us in the Episcopal Church aren't probably real familiar with, or so we think. At least it got me to thinking. As I've come to see the Eucharist and receiving Christ's body and blood, which we're going to do in just a few minutes, I see that as a revival, a restoration of who we really are. Given that the image of God in each of us has been tarnished, maybe even to the point where it seems hidden under layers of grime, we're desperately in need of some restoration not unlike an old painting whose images and colors have been buried under years of dust and soot. So when you have confessed your sins and you've reconciled with your neighbor by sharing the peace of Christ, prepare to have the Jesus in you restored. And may that image of God be revealed like that old painting, allowing its vibrant colors to shine like the day it was painted. When we consume the body and blood of Christ, it is not some pious religious ritual. It's the most essential nourishment any of us can ever receive. That holy food serves to revive and restore the body of Christ, which is an essential part of who you are, who we all are, who everyone is. So be revived and remember who you are. And in that revival, see Christ revealed in everyone. As Paul proclaimed, Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. Amen.